Thanks for listening to Gossip with Celebrity, brought to you by Celebrity.com. This week, we talk about the Royals and about Donald Trump and Malcolm Gladwell. We end with our weekly feature, the comments of the week. The stories, photos, and tweets we talk about can be found at Celebrity.com slash podcast under episode 131. I'm Katie, the founder and editor of Celebrity.com, and I write a Celebrity. And I'm Chandra, I'm the head writer for Celebrity, and I write as Kaiser. So we're going to be off next week because we've done three weeks now and we'll have another episode on August 27th, but we're going to take a break right after that because it's Labor Day. Yeah. We earned a break. (laughs) It'll be the U.S. Open. Oh, okay. That's good for you. It's been crazy at my house. My son is going to college Monday, so I've been trying to get ready for that and manage all these orders and crap he needs. It's been a lot getting ready for my son for college. I realize now that the duvet cover didn't fit and like just all this stupid shit and trying to figure out what he needs and it's just a lot of stress. So, Do you have like a Walmart close by that you can just get emergency supplies? Oh, yeah. And I have a pickup order that he's picking up, you know, in about an hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> I order stuff and I'm like, you go pick it up now, <laughs> which is good. I like that they have that. We didn't have that at our last Walmart. So, yeah, we're doing stuff like that. That's still happening. (laughs) And plus, it's been chaotic at work this week. I mean, you're dealing with that, and we're dealing with a really weird work week. Like, August, like, are always kind of a weird time for gossip. There are usually, like, a few big stories happening, but then otherwise it's just, like, totally dead, and everyone's off on vacation, and I don't know. It's been really weird, yeah. It's just a weird gossip time. We're not going to cover these stories in our talk today because we don't want to fucking talk about them. It's too much work to write about them. But K-Fed and Brittany and Anne Hesh, those are just sad stories. Yeah. And the K-Fed stuff in particular, like people have really strong opinions on it. And I just feel like they're both kind of dealing with it poorly dealing with the situation poorly and i don't know yeah i wish that none of it was happening in public there are some stories like that that we cannot come down either side of and if we make only mild statements on either side people will yell at us regardless like it's just insane and that's one of those stories it's hard to navigate those people have strong feelings about it yeah for sure So, you've been watching tennis. You like talking about tennis. That's your escape. Yeah, my escape is tennis. But tennis is like a huge bummer right now because Serena is on the cover of the September Vogue and she announced her retirement without saying the words, I am retiring. (laughs) She's saying goodbye to the sport at the U.S. Open. So, like, basically, whenever she loses in New York, that will be her last match ever as a professional tennis player. And she turned pro when she was like 15 or 16 years old. So it's a 25-year tennis career. She changed the game, you know. Completely. Changed the women's game completely. Changed the sport entirely. Who gets to play tennis? Who is an acceptable, socially acceptable champion? She changed the money in the sport. Yeah, Venus and Serena, they changed everything. I related to what she said about being bad at goodbyes because I've had some of those in my life recently. And I just am like, okay, we're leaving. Yeah. And I don't really want to drag it out. That's hard, you know. And for Serena in particular, she's been saying goodbye for years now. Like she's been playing less and less. She got injured at last year's Wimbledon and she was gone for a year from the tour. I said it in the post, like, She's gotten the public used to not seeing her. It doesn't feel like, oh, all of a sudden she's retiring while she's on top. No, it's been coming, and we've known it's been coming, but it's still sad. She'll do something with the sport, and she'll be a commentator. And Well, I mean, they'd be lucky to have her as a commentator, but she's rich as hell, and she's getting... She doesn't need that shit. Yeah, she's getting richer every day. (laughs) Yeah, she's super into her Serena ventures and being the seed money for women in business. And so she's just cool. She definitely wants to have another baby. That would be sweet. I think it's funny that Olympia only wants a little sister. She doesn't want a little brother whatsoever, but she wants 
a baby sister. She would get used to it a little brother. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about the royals. So last week we talked about Prince Charles accepting over a million pounds from the Bin Laden family, <laughs> like after Osama was captured and, you know, they took care of him. <laughs> but it gets worse. This week, we heard that he met with a Russian oligarch with ties to Putin. <laughs> this man gave him hundreds of thousands of pounds and pledged $3 million to the Prince's Trust over a period of like 10 years. That's some power that these people have over him. You know, it's despicable. It is despicable. I don't think it was the Prince's Trust. I think it was the Prince's Foundation, actually, which is oh, a okay. separate thing. I didn't know the difference. <laughs> yeah, the Prince's Trust is like his scheme to get kids, like, education and work. And, like, the Prince's Trust is actually kind of above board. The Prince's okay. Foundation is where all the shady shit is going down. He keeps accepting all of these million dollar donations from you know this oligarch and this despot and <laughs> they all go to his foundation suitcase. yeah and yeah. this suitcase full of cash and so this guy has like really close ties to putin and everyone's like so what's next they're gonna be stories about him accepting two million dollars in cash in a suitcase from vladimir putin himself basically <laughs> that's insane and He's supposed to be investigated for the cash for honor scheme, which we didn't even hear these details when we heard about that. And Scotland Yard hasn't interviewed the head of his foundation who left the fall guy, Michael Fawcett. Right. And they pushed Michael Fawcett out of the foundation months ago because he was supposed to be their fall guy. He was supposed to take the blame for all of this mess. And Scotland Yard hasn't even bothered talking to him or investigating any of it. They're not going to do anything. They can't. So all of that concern about even needing a fall guy. They didn't need one. Nope. Since we're talking about shady royal finances, we got some numbers for William and Kate's Royal Foundation and heard that they spent 12.1 million pounds on Earthshot and only gave out 5 million pounds in awards. So they spent 7 million on like promoting it and holding it how is that at all good or helpful to the environment because the whole thing with earthshot was that all of a sudden it was totally fine for william specifically to have corporate sponsorship for his stuff remember when harry and megan were there and they were trying to figure out some sort of system where they could raise money for charity they wanted to you know, take money from corporations and that kind of stuff. And they were told, no, you can't do that. A royal can't get in bed with all these corporations. But suddenly it was fine for William. So he was getting all of these million dollar donations from Bloomberg and whomever. He's just misspending the money. He's throwing parties for himself and doing whatever. Earth shot. Those videos they had <laughs> where they compared Kate to Malala. I'm sure it's... <laughs> That wasn't for Earthshot. That was I know, for it's still... her stupid little keen early years bullshit. I don't even know who's funding all of those videos and all those pie charts. But yeah. <laughs> those pie charts. <laughs> Buying other people's research. I mean, somebody's on the take within Earthshot or in the Royal Foundation. I think it's more likely the Royal Foundation itself. They have too much overhead expense. There's a huge story that nobody's really dug into or the details haven't been leaked about another reason why they pushed out Megan. It's because she probably saw those finances and that's why she had the money going directly to her charities when she had her things that were so transparent and obvious. Like, okay, you buy these clothes, it goes to the charity. You buy this cookbook, it goes to the women. Right. You know, it doesn't go through these umbrella organizations to be filtered out and to enrich various behind the scenes people. Yeah, I would love for Megan to actually like talk about exactly what happened with even just specifically the cookbook, because I feel like so much of the stories about, oh, Megan wanted to do this and this and we weren't prepared to help her. She's such a diva because she wanted us to work for her. I think that was her trying to organize the cookbook and 
she kept on having to go outside of the palace to get help. And yet they forced her to put the proceeds of the cookbook, filter that through the Royal Foundation. And she didn't, ultimately. Well, she did. The money went to the Royal Foundation and then immediately went to Hub Community Kitchen. Okay. Like she was able to wall off the money within the Royal Foundation. And I think that's the only way that she would agree to the scheme is if the money could be walled off. Imagine how hard she had to fight for that. Yep, exactly. And that does the old organization. That's what I would just love for her to talk about that specific issue of how she got that done. She's so classy. Like yeah. <laughs> she hasn't gone scorched earth so far. So... We don't have this on our list, but we should talk about the fact that Prince Harry filed another lawsuit against the Metropolitan Police. That was an oversight that I didn't put that on our list. No, it's fine. It's not like a huge story because we don't even know exactly what the second lawsuit is about. I think it's just a continuation of the stuff that's already happening. For months now, he's been suing the Home Office, which is, I don't even know what the equivalent of it is. Like Department of Justice, maybe. Okay. And so he's suing the Home Office because they're ultimately in charge of who gets royal protection and who pays for it. And now he's suing the Metropolitan Police directly because I would assume he thinks that they're also in charge of who gets security and who pays for it. Because he wasn't even able to pay for his own security. Right. I was more interested in that story. Like, I was like, oh, we could skip it. But then I read that Omid Scobie wrote about it. And he was saying how bad the threats are against Harry and Meghan and how dangerous it is for them. And they haven't said jack shit about that either. Right. Apart from, you know, Harry's lawsuit, they really haven't made that public. I think they want to downplay it, but. Exactly. And it's just another reminder that these people, I mean, they're just such assholes. Who honestly believes that? your security as a royal person should follow your status rather than your threat level. The people with high status who are threatened. Yeah. And not threatened, who are intimidated by them. Their argument, like the home office's argument, is that Harry doesn't have his HRH and Harry stepped away from royal duties. Therefore, he doesn't deserve security. No, security is supposed to follow the threat level. Yeah. Yeah. And he's got the memoir coming out this fall. And ahead of that, there's going to be four royal biographies that we've heard of. There might be some others that crop up. And they're not only trying to, like, muddy the waters ahead of Prince Harry's biography. They're surely trying to capitalize on the huge amount of success he's going to have with that. Right. And they're trying to get in before his memoir is released and blows them all out of the water. They're just trying to make money (laughs) while the getting is good. But what I like is that not all of the books are going to even be about Harry. It's Charles trying to get attention. It's Camilla trying to get attention. That's funny. Yeah, because there's a biography of Camilla from Angela Levin. And Catherine Mayer, is that how you pronounce her name? I think so. Has a biography about Charles called The Heart of a King. And the Mayer book. It's for money, it should say, (laughs) or whatever. (laughs) The Mayer book, I think there's the promise that that will have more information about Harry and Meghan leaving. Like, that's the big claim that maybe she sold the book on that claim of, oh, she's going to reveal some never-before-heard information about Charles's role in Sussex. Oh. The two big ones that I'm interested in are the Valentine Lowe book, which is called Courtiers, The Hidden Power Behind the Crown, and Katie Nichols' book, The New Royals. And you know, the New Royals are the stupid Cambridges. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, I mean, credit where it's due. Katie Nichol has real sources within the Middleton camp. So... Yeah, It's going to be fascinating to see what narrative she spins and what information they were giving her. It's not going to be all sugary bullshit. Maybe it will be, but it'll be interesting in any case. But Valentine Lowe, that book is going to be terrible for the Sussexes. <laughs> no, it is, because he's an actual reporter, and he's going to have, like, Tory sources, he's going to have Clarence House sources, and Kensington Palace. They're going to do a lot of smear. 
yeah. a whole new smear campaign is going to be launched with Valentine Lowe's book. And he's the one who broke the bullying story exactly. about Megan. Yep. So he was pushing that ridiculous narrative. Well, I mean, that narrative was handed to him by Kensington Palace. Yeah. Which had no substance behind it and nothing. <laughs> and not even one story. It's all vibes and feels. Uh-huh. And... No, really, she made me cry. Well, how did she make you cry? What did she say? No, you don't understand. She made me cry. And I'm white. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Then we got all these, speaking of people saying she made me cry and I'm white, they had <laughs> stories about, Kate was covering People magazine, we covered that last week, but they had more and beginning stories about her, and her uncle Gary did an interview where he said she's so brilliant, quote, as a wife, a mom, a counsel, a partner, an ambassador, a figurehead, and a future queen. Like, lay it on any fucking thicker. That is just... Ridiculous that someone could even say that <laughs> about her. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, wow, are they really back to interviewing Gary Goldsmith now? He's been MIA for months now. He was laying it on real thick last year, especially after the Oprah interview. Like they sent Gary out to do a lot of dirty work. Mm-hmm. And he was like adding a lot of nastiness on top of Meghan and Harry. We haven't heard from him in months now. And all of a sudden he pops up and it feels like there's some weird energy at Camp Middleton. They're nervous about something. They're desperados over there. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Kate's moving into Adelaide Cottage with the kids. William is God knows where. They seem to be living separately. And Camp Middleton is making sure that Kate is still going to be the wife of record. Basically. She's going to be queen. Yeah, she's going to be queen come hell or high water. So let's talk about Trump. He had a raid finally. His home in Mar-a-Lago was raided. He was in New York when that happened. And it was because he was keeping classified government documents that he stole from the White House down there. And we know because he complained about it on his social network, Truth Social, which is where he's posting now. And otherwise, like, I don't know how many details we would be getting, but he's been destroying evidence (laughs) and documents that are supposed to go in the National Archives. And we heard in February he's been flushing stuff down the toilet. Like, don't you have a shredder? Don't you <laughs> just start a big fire? Like that's the most inefficient way of destroying to get documents. Rid of stuff. Is clogging your toilet with classified documents. Like children know not to <laughs> shove papers in the toilet, you know? There's shredders for that. Yeah, and so the above board Washington Post reporting on this was that Everyone knew that he had stolen classified documents and the FBI had already gone down to Mar-a-Lago and they had like reviewed his basement files, basically, because he was keeping all of these files in the Mar-a-Lago basement. And they're like, this shit isn't secure. okay, but like, we're glad you showed us all of this stuff. So at least we know where it is if we ever need to come back for it. My theory is that the National Archivists were like. Yeah, so he stole all of that information, all those classified documents, but there's a lot of shit missing. And so you need to go down there Uh, and go find everything. They're like, holy shit, you know, he stole all of this stuff. We can't find this, this, this. He's such a grifter. So his businesses are also under investigation in New York by the Attorney General Letitia James. He was deposed for that, and he pled the fifth, which is rare for him because he loves to talk and incriminate himself. (laughs) And his lawyer admitted that it took a lot of convincing to get him to plead the fifth. Yeah. And so this was the deposition he was supposed to sit for when Ivana died. Like, Ivana mysteriously died, and then the deposition was put off for a few weeks or whatever it was. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oof. (laughs) So everyone was like, (laughs) avoid staircases, Melania. Oh, God. (laughs) Yeah, so Letitia James is the New York Attorney General, and so this is all about banking. This is all about his okay. loans and his lies to get loans. Businesses. Because for a second, 
as I was covering it, I was like, wait, is this about all of the charity schemes? Because remember, that's being investigated too. His whole like yeah. charity scheme was a big controversy anyway. He's being investigated 20 different ways. And none of it has anything to do with the insurrection yet. Yeah. The FBI raid didn't have anything to do with the insurrection. The New York Attorney General, that's not about the insurrection either. So that's a whole other thing. We'll get him somehow. <laughs> so <laughs> we talked about this on Zoom, and this is Zakia, Onaz, Susan, and Karen. So what are everyone's thoughts on the Trump search? I do love the fact that he's being taken down by librarians. The police Unless we're archivists, him, right? The trees and people couldn't get him, but the librarians. Listen, you owe us documents, you piece of shit. We're coming after you. <laughs> it's like, what's his name? Al Capone with the taxes, right? Like yeah. it's where you least expect it in the end. You guys put this in the stories. Like, I feel like they wouldn't have gone all out like that if it wasn't so solid that there was no arguing. Because no judge would have signed that off otherwise. I mean, because it's historical. Yeah. Plus, the head of the well, FBI is the guy Trump appointed. So, you know, yeah. they can't claim it's some some Democrat or something. Did Trump make it a felony to... Yes. Um, yes, he did. To have sensitive documents. He was trying to get Hillary in her emails. But, yeah. I saw today that someone actually called them and told them, like, they took about a dozen boxes before and they thought there were more, but someone actually called them and told them that he had more boxes and where it was. He has to be in a shit load of trouble. If they're talking to him, he's not listening. They bypass the subpoena, get the DOJ, the head of the FBI and a judge to sign off on searching a former president. It's not just some documents that he had, that he was keeping secret, that he said they're mine. I'm thinking like really high security for a few eyes only type of secrets. Ultimately, he's selling information. He's benefiting from it somehow. He's committing treason. And he's in a shit load of trouble. So, yeah, it's like what Onaz is saying. They're going to get him for something that you don't think. Like how they got Capone on taxes. And Zakia is saying that she thinks he's selling information. Do you think that's the case or...? I don't think he's selling. I think he's giving. I think he's <laughs> he's giving information. <laughs> I don't think he's smart enough to put together some sort of scam where he sells classified documents to Russia. I think he gives classified documents to Russia because he's that much of a fucking idiot. He thinks it's a quid pro quo thing. Yeah, that's more like it. Not like a firm, I'm selling you this information. Yeah. He owes Russia tons of money. He owes all of these foreign creditors tons of money. He just gives the information away. Yeah, that's probably what she means too. But it's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would like to see him get taken down, obviously, and I can't keep up with the intricacies of his crimes and stories. I don't think he can either, and. <laughs> It'll be fun to watch him get taken down in various ways. Whatever they do to him, I want to see it. Yeah, what's interesting about this FBI raid is that all of the Republicans, none of them knew what it was for. They all knew Trump had done something <laughs> bad. So they were just all panicked. <laughs> but now they're running a play. Have you noticed that? No, it's going on. Once they figured out that it was just about classified documents, they're running a play. They're like, oh, how dare the FBI, the Democrats at the FBI. There are no Democrats at the FBI, for goodness sake. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're Trump appointees. They got their dogs in a row. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about Malcolm Gladwell. So you've read a bunch of his books. I've skimmed them, and I'm familiar with him, but he's not <laughs> my cup of tea, really. He's kind of a Yeah, hack. it's just like pseudoscience. They're fun reads. I don't know. I liked David and Goliath a lot. Okay. I thought that was a good one. So he did a podcast interview where he trashed working from home. And he used all the tropes that 
you know, people who complain about it, like employers who complain about it do. And he said, quote, it's not in your best interest to work at home. I know it's a hassle to come into the office, but if you're just sitting in your pajamas in your bedroom, is that the work life you want to lead? You want to live? <laughs> Uh, don't you want to feel part of something? Then he complained about employers like not convincing people to come into work. And it's just bullshit. Propaganda. Yeah. And he's a corporate shill. Like, oh, all the worker bees need to feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. That was one of his arguments. And that's just not work culture in America anymore. No. I mean, if you work for a corporation or a law firm or something like that, you aren't feeling like you're part of something bigger. This is not a sort of work culture where you're still getting a gold watch when you retire after working for the same company for 40 years. No. No one does that anymore. That's not a thing anymore. Because those companies don't exist and they don't honor their workers. And Right. Yeah. Unions don't exist. We're having to fight for those. Like, it's a lot. Yeah. And the pandemic has shown a lot of people that there are different ways to work and to work from home and to go back and forth, you know, spend two days in the office and three days at home. And that's fine. Like, figure out what works for you and try to find the work arrangement that suits you. Exactly. And working from home suits me. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I haven't worked in an office in 20 years and I do not miss it at all. The cubicles and the drama. And I mean, I had work friends and they were nice, but you know, I don't need that every day, maybe once a week. <laughs> yeah, like that's what I think too. I love working from home. I love being quiet and getting my stuff done. I think I would enjoy maybe going into an office environment like once or twice a month. I a think month, that would yeah. be nice. <laughs> a month, that's good. Yeah, Once not a week. Weeks. <laughs> Once every two weeks. Yeah, go in for a meeting, say hi to everyone. That would be fine. Have lunch and then go home yeah. for the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, I don't miss working in an office. It takes a lot out of you, too. It's emotional work. Yeah, it is. And I was thinking about like comparing it to homeschooling. I think when you're younger, you do need to be around people. You need to have those socialization skills. Yeah. And then when you're an adult, you can make the choices about when do I socialize? Who do I socialize with? Instead of being forced into an environment where you have to work in an office, you know, five days a week and you have to socialize with these people. It's different when you're an adult. It is different. And some people are more extroverted like that and they prefer that and some people are not. But it also, I think it's a productivity suck to be in an office because you don't really have to do work. You can just, you know, be on your computer faking it and people think you're working because you're there. You know, when you're home, you really have to produce. Yeah. And someone in the comments, I probably should have written it down but they're like office environments aren't built for workers they're built for managers and yeah. i was like wow that's really profound <laughs> and they've shown like working from home i've read this other places too has shown how useless some of these middle managers are right and that's why they're mad and why these people are like come back to the office <laughs> they want to boss people around yeah and plus the whole real estate issue is yeah that's true getting bigger by the day of how much money and time has been spent on all of this corporate real estate. And exactly. now it's not being used the same way or not being used at all. Yep. Oh, well, society changes. <laughs> all right, let's move on to the comments of the week. Okay. My comment of the week is from, um, oh, the post about, Earthshot and Prince William and only $5 million was given to the prize money and the rest was just wasted. So Digital Unicorn wrote, the royal family's a money laundering scheme, plain and simple. I'm sure that they've got loads of advice on how to do that from Chuck and Carol and Uncle Gary. Yup. <laughs> it's only a matter of time until the press start actually reporting on William's financial shenanigans instead of Chuck's. I know he has at least one super injunction on his keen pegging, but I think there's another one to cover the shadiness of the royal family. I have not heard anything about a super injunction on the pegging story. I just want to say that for the record. But if it's true, I'll talk about it. What is a super injunction? 
<laughs> that reportedly William got some sort of injunction on British media about the Rose Hanberry story. Oh, that's true. I don't think he's responded at all to the pegging story. Right. I don't think he's gotten an injunction or even sent out lawyers notices or anything like that about the pegging story. Right now it's just quiet and dead. Yeah, and that's good. That's the way he should have handled it, which is surprising that he did it that way. <laughs> you know, like you would think he would freak out. Yeah, but it's interesting that the British media hasn't really focused on William's finances. Oh, yeah. I mean, Charles is obviously a lot shadier. Charles has a longer history of taking money from inappropriate people and giving honors and God knows what else to those There's people. There's probably a lot to untangle with William. Yeah. And we'll see. I think William just can't wait to get his hands on the Prince of Wales money, the Duchy of Cornwall estate. Yeah. I mean, that's millions and millions of dollars that he's going to use as his personal piggy bank. And how much money did these fuckers need? Like, they have all that real <laughs> estate and all that rent coming in. And they're still getting buttloads of cash from these shady characters? Like There is like a history for Charles is that he he's made some bad calls with his foundation. He bought that stupid property up in Scotland and he's been trying to like make it awesome. into an investment and it's not working. He owes millions of dollars, but his foundation has the money. I don't know. I haven't even done a deeper dive on that. So they're trying to cover for their financial mistakes. Right. You could say that. Like, he needed to take millions of dollars from shady people because he was trying to cover up bad management for his foundation. But that doesn't make any sense because he didn't owe that much money. Like, he made bad investments, but they were like a $10 million bad investment. And he obviously has enough to cover that. So this is like the plot line in Downton Abbey where they were talking about pigs. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Exactly. I'm like, what? (laughs) And Charles is lucky because his scandals are like that. They're very financial and dry and people just get bored with it. Yeah. So that's what I was doing. So my comment of the week is on the post about Ben Affleck taking Jennifer Lopez to Dunkin' Donuts because people were in there like rating the coffee from Starbucks versus Dunkin' Donuts and and they were talking about the differences in donuts too. And what what wrote, as a donut connoisseur, lol, my opinion (laughs) is that overall Dunkin' Donuts is better than Krispy Kreme. Krispy Kreme is only good when they're hot slash fresh. However, you can almost always get better donuts at a local baking shop. There's a smaller chain, Duck Donuts, that started in Duck, North Carolina, but now has several locations. Their donuts are amazing. <laughs> so I'm not a donut person, but I thought that was cute. I have a mood sometimes where I really need donuts. It doesn't happen all that often. I actually prefer Krispy Kreme. I like the lightness of the cake. They melt in your mouth. Yeah, I think Dunkin' Donuts can sometimes be too heavy. At Dunkin' Donuts, they're like qualitatively different, the Dunkin' Donuts versus the Krispy Kreme. Because Krispy Kreme oh, yeah. are like just special melt-in-your-mouth donuts. And Dunkin' Donuts are okay. Like, they just have standard, okay, this has got cream, this has got glaze, you know? The thing about, oh, they need to be fresh, that's true of all donuts. Like, yeah. every donut is better when it's fresh. And I feel like Dunkin' Donuts donuts just turn into hockey pucks they're so hard if you let them sit for like yes especially the glaze it glaze gets like a crustiness to it that's nasty (laughs) like a waxy crusty i love bagels no i can't do bagels but i've been making my own bagels and i really like that i do it takes a lot of work but i love it (laughs) when i lived in germany and stuff i just got spoiled for baked goods like the baked goods they have there are phenomenal So I'm not that into the donuts and such here. Yeah, Germany, France, they have big baked good cultures. The culture of everything bread and croissants. I miss that. (laughs) Pretzels. and The pretzels are really good, too. All right. Well, thanks for listening, bitches. Thanks, bitches.
Thank you for listening to the Celebrity Podcast. Please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen. If you like us, please turn off your ad blocker when you visit our site. You can text us or leave a voicemail at 434-218-3219. Our music is from AA Alto, Maiden, and via Premium Beat and Sound of Picture. Thanks again. 